system which stays. I have a guiding system that stays the same, and then I can switch out the camera and the uh, the optics. Mm -hmm. So that'll give me enough variety. I mean, I've got um, probably it'll allow me to run between 105 and almost 600 actually millimeters. Uh, just running on the Star Adventure. Oh, okay. Uh, that's okay. really kind of the 600 is a upper limit for yeah. the adventure, anyways. Well, that, that sounds like a good setup. I'm, I'm just going to stay with my Red Cat till I figure everything out. Red, 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 red Cat is good. Uh, it doesn't have a reducer, right? You, you just have the straight Red Cat. That's right. So you're running about, oh, two, 250. I guess 250 millimeters. Yeah, I've been told not to put a reducer on there, but uh, can you? Or I, 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 I suppose you can. I, I don't think I would recommend it either because uh, once you move down into like 200 millimeters, everything gets quite small. So un unless you're shooting Andromeda and Pleiades, it's not really as as effective actually. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll get this one figured out, and uh, I may put another scope on it, have the two scopes. You can uh, uh, run two scopes live, so that's sort of on my mind. We'll see if we... Um... Yeah, just just uh, just weigh out all the components and see if it makes sense to do it. Yeah. So I guess Gary's not on tonight. He's uh, on his way down south, apparently. Yes, he's crossed the border. It's, I assume uh, by his city is there. Yeah. He said he was going to try and join us next week. Oh, yeah, he'll be down there by then. Yeah. How long is he going down for? Several months. Yep. Typically, they go from November to March or April. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to really enjoy it this time because they're planning on selling. Yeah, yeah, he said yeah. he's going to, going to put it up for sale. And he's got a property out on the peninsula, a friend who uh, he thinks he's going to be able to relocate his observatory. Or at least the telescopes with the new observatory. Yeah. I hope it all works out for him. <laughs> yeah, me too. Give him another couple of years of tinkering. <laughs> right? Well, he's an engineer, so he loves tinkering. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he likes doing stuff hands-on. There's no doubt about that. He's going to have to get himself a do management system. He's going to, he's, he's going to be uh, observing from farming country in central North Savage. So uh, he's going to have some. He's going issues. to have do do issues in the, in the well the winter months. Well, not on the primary of those scopes, but uh, certainly on the on the eyepieces and secondary, perhaps. Um, you know, even a twenty-inch, uh, you can leave it open to the sky pretty much all the time, unless it gets really damp. It gets really damp in the area he's in, uh, proposing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not too not it's a... not too far away from Saint Stephen's Church, actually. Oh yeah, what he was describing to me. Probably not as damp as the observing field I was at when they had the combined Hamilton Auckland Star Party down by the Hauraki Gulf. 
I had my eight inch uh, rebuilt down there into a Dobby. And uh, after an hour and a half, the primary dude over. <laughs> it was so wet. It was just dripping water on the outside of the tube. Yeah. But then, you know, it's only a hundred yards off of the ocean. So. <laughs> are, are Gary's scopes open? Are they trusses or are they tubes? They're tubes. Tubes. Yeah. Both, so both of a, them. Well, that'll help a lot. He'll just need something on the secondary, a heater on yeah. the secondary. He, he, easy he, thing. He, secondary and, and, and have fans on the back that draw air down the tube so that uh, you, you keep dry air coming in and it'll pull the condensation out pretty well. As long as you don't get the mirror down too much below ambient, it should be okay. Certainly on my 10 inch, I, I've not had trouble with the fan running. And that's, you know, pretty damp nights down at Cattle Point. I've not had an issue. Yeah. I don't, don't have heat on my secondary, but I do have on my finder and on the eyepieces, so. If, if anybody wants to learn how to build an eyepiece heater, I can show you. <laughs> Soldering iron, a bunch of resistors, and some copper tape that they use for doing stained glass windows, and some Velcro. Yeah, I just uh, cannibalized a heating pad. Just took mm -hmm. the nichrome wire out of a heating pad that I wasn't using anymore. That I works built, fine too. Built, I built a couple of them with some. Uh, Nichrome wire that came out of the the ones that you wrap around a uh, a water service when you have a cabin out in the country. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, self-regulating heat tape. So I stripped a couple of those down, but it's actually easier to do it with resistors. You just have to figure out the uh, and I do them with with half watt resistors and uh, just figure out how many of them you need to get about three watts on an eyepiece, and you're pretty good. Hmm. Just get started in a minute. Good. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, this evening, um, I have on the, already on the list uh, to speak uh, Dave uh, Payne, Margie, and uh, we've got some Edmonton photos. Um, does anybody else? Uh, Laurie, did you want to say something this evening? <laughs> yes, please. I've got a couple of things. Okay. Thank you. And anybody else? Chris, I, I might have something if uh, okay. if Randy comes on board tonight. He asked a question about uh, removing stars from, from images a few weeks ago, and something came up in the news that uh, about neural networks that reminded me of his question. So if he shows up tonight, I'll say a few words about that. Sure. I, yeah, I don't know if he's back yet, but um, okay. I noticed a Facebook post he was still on the ship, so he may still be. Just um, maybe we'll uh, yeah. well, maybe we'll get try saying happy birthday over Zoom to Chris. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's spare him. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to scare Thank away you. people. <laughs> don't want to scare away Chris. Yeah. I would unmute to sing happy birthday. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, so, uh, yes, as uh, I guess you, you may have noticed, therefore, it is the, uh, I am the birthday boy tonight. So there we go. Um, so thank you for the wishes. Um, so uh, we have um, some people um, lined up to speak this evening. And um, yeah, Jeff, I see you're there. Um, so I was going to ask Jeff to say a few words um, about, uh, he's um, arranged for us to have a guest speaker next month. And uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, ask Jeff to tell us about the guest speaker next month. Well, thanks very much, Chris. Um, I, I was able to reach out through some very arm's length contacts um, to uh, Dr. Robert Thursk, uh, who was one of the original six astronauts uh, with the Canadian Space Agency. 
Um, he agreed to speak with our group in December. Um, he's an incredibly accomplished fellow. It's one of those guys who has a bio, you know, you realize how little you've accomplished in your life. Um, you know, can I quickly do the screen share, um, Chris? Is that is that something I'm able to to do? Or Sorry, I should unmute. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Do you folks see that? Yeah, we can see it. Great. So, so he's, it's, it's actually a whole bunch of things came together to get this arranged. Um, Dr. Thirsk was actually, is actually a BC boy. He was born in, in New Westminster. Um, he acquired um, Bachelor of Engineering through University of Calgary, where I'm, where I'm an alumnus. Uh, he got his uh, Master's of Science in um, Mechanical Engineering at MIT then did a, um, a medical degree, uh, an MD through McGill, uh, graduated in 82. In 83, he was chosen as one of the six original Canadian astronauts. Uh, everybody here is probably aware of him or familiar with him from uh, uh, flying in the space shuttle in uh, 1996. Uh, he flew in on the space shuttle Columbia on a mission known as SDS-78. He was a payload specialist on that flight. He did a bunch of things uh, with NASA um, in, the, in the late 90s and early uh, 2000s. In the 2009, he uh, flew on a, a Soyuz uh, sp uh, spacecraft to the International Space Station where he was um, a crew member uh, for about uh, half a year. Um, uh, most recently, and when I met him uh, and spoke with him, uh, he was Chancellor of the University of Calgary um, between 2014 and 2018. A uh, very approachable guy. He's accumulated a bunch of awards. He's a member of the Order of British Columbia because of his uh, place of birth. He's also an, an officer of the Order of Canada. Um, he talks about having an ongoing focus on exploration, innovation, and education. And when I reached out <clears throat> through his website, um, I thought that speaking to a group that's interested in science, especially in astronomy and space, you know, in British Columbia might be a real um, um, plug, especially at a time when uh, speaking engagements are limited and most stuff is done by Zoom. So, you know, as it turned out, he was agreeable. Chris and I had a little bit of back and forth about the topic uh, with um, his manager. Uh, and actually, uh, Dr. Thirsk, I thought, proposed a topic that would be more interesting than either, either of us was coming up with. He, he would like to address us on mission to Mars, um, upcoming plans for human exploration of the red planet, as well as some of the technologies that must be developed and medical challenges to be overcome before launch of the first crew. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty excited uh, that uh, he's been uh, agreeable to, to speak with us. Uh, and I think that's, Chris, just to verify, it's scheduled for December the 13th. That's uh, correct, yes. Great. And so, we, we need to be very nice to him because, of course, it will be 10.30 his time because he lives in the Eastern time zone. So. Yeah, actually. <laughs> he, said he'd, he said he'd have a nap before he spoke. Yeah. So. Yeah. But uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, that's great that you, uh, you reached out and uh, were able to uh, connect uh, with him and get him uh, as a guest speaker for, uh, for our next, uh, next month's speaker. So looking forward to that. Super. Chris, I'll send this um, little precy to you so you can put this as part of the minutes of, uh, of today's meeting. Thank you. Good, thanks. I'll you know, take this off if I can. And uh, Dave Payne, if you're uh, standing by, that would be great. Chris, can I just add something before David starts? Sure. <clears throat> I was just thinking this would be a, a wonderful uh, presentation to give to not just our own group of 20 people, but to put out to the centers, um, as, as many of the centers do, they put on what they're doing and on different days. And this might be one that we actually put in the bulletin and, and put out the, um, uh, the uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom uh, webinar or sorry, the, the Zoom link and get other people from across Canada to be part of this. That's a wonderful idea, Lori. 
I mean, I think the only thing that we'd have to be attentive to is that the, I think the Zoom is limited to 100 people. So do we have a, a Zoom that can- I Right, yes. I think the thing that saves us is the time for, um, it would be mostly people, I guess, in Western Canada, unless people want to stay up late. People like Peter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll need to use the national uh, Zoom yeah. uh, account instead of our own, because our own is limited to 50. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Do, okay. Do, you think it, do you think it would be best to to just do Western Canada? I mean, because of the the time zones. I'm also a little sensitive to the fact that you know, as, as Zoom calls get bigger, there's a you know more chance of it, it being bombed. Um, have you folks had any of that experience? I, I guess the the professional account though has uh, better security. There's a webinar setting so that nobody can do anything okay it can only make you put things in the chat and that's it I see. Yeah. we we could always monitor the admits as well i mean if we see something that looks strange we don't have to let them in okay and, and you send that out by invitation only do usually yeah okay yeah and normally these are only going to um victoria center members so um and seeing as he's a handled person is it allowed to be recorded it's a very good question. Um, you should ask that he question. Might, he might don't not. <laughs> should 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 clarify that for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it will. It, it wasn't mentioned, and it's usually the speaker that indicates that. But I, I mean, out of courtesy, I think it's a very good question. Could you follow up with uh, Brenda on that? To, yeah? Yes, of course Thanks. I will. Sure. Okay, and then we can see what we want to do about um, because certainly if if the talk is recorded that does make it more accessible to people at least after the fact they can ask and ask questions but at least they can see see the talk and actually that that reminds me chris i'll probably need to ask emily as well for next week yeah yeah could you do that follow up with her too Uh, yeah. Chris, one other thing, I, I did confirm with Brenda that he would be available for a, about a 20 minute Q&A after the presentation. Right, thank you. So yeah, roughly kind of an hour all in. Yeah, that's plus fine. or minus a bit. Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you again. Um, is there anything further on that particular topic or shall we, are we ready for Dave? To play a show or a movie on a TV with Chromecast, you can say something like, Okay. Yeah, if you're ready, you may carry on. Um, okay. share this. Sure. Share the screen. The mic. Okay. So it was a long time ago, but we actually had clear skies. What do I want this? And uh, had three nights of clear skies. So I was willing to cap, I was able to capture four clusters and um, both some narrow band and broad band of, of the flying bat nebula and the squid nebula. But uh, all I've been able to manage to process are uh, two star clusters so far, and I thought I'd share them. The first one, hopefully it's on the screen, yeah, is uh, the double cluster in uh, Perseus. Um, it, it was interesting because they were all lined up pretty much near the zenith, and I just spent two hours on, two and a half hours on each one and as they as they passed over so because they were at the zenith we got some pretty good shots so the double cluster um is named because there's two clusters and uh i managed to get great great uh great color in the stars and you can actually tell and contrast it with the second cluster i'm going to show um but before i before I switch, these stars are all very young. The clusters are about um, three to six million years old, which may seem like old, but, but not really. They're all white bluish stars, be 
D0 is their spectral designation. Um, both of the clusters can contain about 200 or so stars. Um, and uh, they're just uh, very pretty in my view. So I wanna contrast a little bit with the, the second cluster. I go back. Which is um, nicknamed Caroline's Rose and it's in Cassiopeia. Um, it was actually discovered by uh, an astronomer named Carolyn Herschel and uh, back, back in the 18th century. Um, you may know her more famous brother, but uh, it's got about the same number of stars in it, but it's less, less well defined. But the significant difference is it's instead of being um, three to six million years old, it's 1.6 billion years old. And the brightest stars in here have already faded. And you can see that uh, it's got uh, the, the stars in here have a more pinkish hue to them than the previous one. Just defined by the age of those age of those stars. Um, the brightest ones of all uh, are, have exhausted a lot of their their fuel by now. So it's got about the same number of stars as the other cluster. And again, I think it's it's nice looking in a different way. It's called the rose because apparently if you squint and occasionally you can actually see the stars sort of forming the shape of petals are around a rose, but, but it takes a bit of imagination. Those are beautiful images, uh, David. Thank you. So I hope to process the Owl Nebula and um, the Pleiades, the other two clusters I've got, but uh, it's for a later date. So thank you. Thank you for sharing those. Very, turning out very well. Margie, are you uh, ready? I am. Please carry on. May I share the screen? Uh, you should be able to, yes. I will share the screen. Maybe we could get rid of the washing machine in the background or whatever it is. Is it possible if you don't have your, um, if you are not muted to mute? We're getting kind of a buzz from somewhere or something. Hopefully it's not. There we go. Oh, it's back. There, now it's gone. Yay. Alrighty. Okay, you are screen sharing. Yes, I am. Uh, I would like to just make this larger. Where are we? Stop video. <laughs> I think the zoom on the, to the left, will that work? Just, just press play. Just press play. Yeah. yeah that'll work too. Odd, oddly enough, there's a black line on top of my, it's, my black line is still there. Isn't that weird? Then I have a new black line. The chat has gone up there. The whole mute, stop video, et cetera, has gone up to the top. All right, I'm almost ready. If I could just find my cursor. <laughs> Where the heck are you? Oh, honestly. All right, I'll get rid of that first. And then I'll have this. And then I'd like to go back to where I was. There we go. All right. This is Dr. Natalie Ouellette. 
Nathalie Ouellette. She is a Canadian from Montreal and she is 34 years of age. She is an astrophysicist and avid science communicator. Her uh, BSc uh, was in 2010 and her Master of Science in 2012, both at McGill. Uh, she did her PhD at Queen's University in 2016. In 2017, she became the Communication, uh, Education and Outreach Officer at the Macdonald Institute in Kingston, Ontario. From 2018 to the present, she is the coordinator of uh, IREX um, and the, uh, the University of Montreal. And she is the James Webb Space Telescope Outreach Scientist for Canada in collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency. Her research leads to better understanding of galaxy formation and evolution. Around her neck, she wears a golden pendant, a replica of the main mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, she says, with the precision of the, of the uh, JSWT, we can study the starlight streaming through the atmosphere of an exoplanet to determine biomarkers about habitability. Her parents are both engineers. At age five, she knew science was to be her career. Uh, she had a high school physics teacher who shared his astronomy passion with her. Oh gosh, no, I'm in my own way here, just a second. <laughs> Where is that darn cursor? My cursor has disappeared. Uh, she said, I think that a scientifically literate society is a much better and more, um, I can't see it because I, my, I can't find my cursor and the, there's a little black box on top of it. Engaged the society. Engaged. <laughs> engaged, thank you. That's engaged, okay. Um, Modern everyday life is, in, is intertwined with science. We can use astronomy to make people trust and be interested in science. I thought that was so interesting. Is the James Webb Ta Space Telescope worth the money? Besides answering science questions, such technologies have everyday applications. Uh, smartphone cameras, Wi-Fi, medical imaging, uh, because in order to build something like the telescope, you have to uh, make things as small as possible and then it can have other applications. She co-hosts an online cosmic club with uh, astronomy activities for kids who are between the ages of eight and 12. She contributes to space stories in Canadian media and to outreach events, making sure all communications materials are scientifically rigorous comprehensible and interesting. She enjoys being the link between research and the public. In her spare time, she rock climbs, paints nebula for her family, and watches really awful movies with her husband. Advice she has for girls, strive, try things, plow ahead, show your passion and motivation. And interestingly, from the Rask Bulletin November, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is a Rask speaker series, James Webb Space Telescope, Canada's role in the exploration of the universe. To, tomorrow at um, uh, 1900 uh, Eastern Standard Time, which of course is four o'clock our time. And she and John Dupuis, uh, are going to speak about the James Webb Space Telescope and Canada's role in this exciting project. Now, getting me out of here when I can't find my, there you are. Stop share. There we go. This talk um, was, um, is in the uh, weekly newsletter for today. I'm just uh, reviewing that. And there is a registration link. So if you want to attend Please do not forget to register. That's right. And in the Sky News, James Webb Telescope. 
she is mentioned in the opening of the universe with Webb. And that is one of the um, media communications that she has been involved with. So her name is, is right there. That's it. Thanks, Margie. And so, um, yeah, so if you are interested in attending that, uh, please do register and it's tomorrow at four. Um, think people have been quite busy in Edmonton. So Dave, if you're uh, ready, I'll get the um, share up here of the uh, Edmonton photos. Uh, let's see, let's do that. And so this is uh, as we can, as we've seen, we've had some pretty spectacular aurora uh, for the last month or so. Um, this was a, a shot that was taken when Alistair and company were out at Black Nugget, I uh, started at Blackfoot, I guess it was, uh, shooting other things. Uh, but at the end of the evening, he decided he would take a, a photograph to the north. Now, the reason that that Aurora is so pinkish is because he has a, a Canon 60D that's been, have a modified IR filter that uh, tended to make it a little more pink than normal. But uh, I recognize those trees. <laughs> due north of the main observing site at uh, Blackwood. And the next one is from, is M1. Uh, that also is, that this one is taken from the Black Nugget Lake Observatory, which is where the big telescope is going to go. And uh, that was taken by Kent. Um, he said he's taken 50 frames. He selected the best 21, stacked them in Images Plus with a small amount of tweaking in Photoshop. He says the files are about three stops underexposed. So, uh, so M1 is uh, the Crab Nebula. And then the third one is from Jeff Robertson. Hold on, it's not changing. Why isn't it changing? And Jeff is, is one of the guys that looks after the school outreach program in Edmonton. And this is a uh, conjunction of uh, the moon and Mercury okay. from the morning of November the 3rd. Now, the next ones. Um, I, I, in order to save space, I, I, uh, Arnold Rivera had, uh, when we heard about this latest uh, uh, outpouring of uh, coronal mass objection on November, the 4th was about to hit. He uh, put his all sky camera out. He shot a, a video, which I did not include because it runs for quite a while and it would have taken up a lot of email space. Uh, but what he's done here is he's taken several shots uh, from that video of the aurora seen through his all sky camera. And uh, as you can see, <laughs> some of these aurora shots covered a lot of sky. So if you can just slowly scroll through them, that would be great. He even had one of these things that kind of looked like Steve. Can see a bit of the pink and purple in there. Of course, that would be a lot more visible if he was not in the middle of the city. You'd see a lot more uh, pink and purple in them. And, and that you can see overhead is coronal aurora. I've only seen that a few times. And you can see that bright purple patch in the, in the dead center. So that was early in the morning, apparently. And this is the last one of those. Yeah. And the next set were from uh, Ian Doctor. And uh, he said his kid woke him up at 2.30 in the morning. And he says, by the time he got him settled down, he went out to, to look at some of these images and he, or he took some images. And you can see this is, all taken north over the city. 
Uh, he must live on the south side of Edmonton. So we should be able to scroll. Well, there's four images there. Yeah, they were small enough that I couldn't really. Yeah, you could put them all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was making them too. They were getting pixelated. So, you know, these these would have been a little bit of an exposure. So in, in real life, they wouldn't be uh, quite so smeared and broad. They'd be a lot more uh, streaky and, and maybe not as bright in, in general, but certainly much brighter in the individual streaks. Uh, this would be the typical, what we call northern curtains that dance and move around. Uh, you know, you have to have to get a ways north to see those. And Edmonton is at times right under the auroral arc, arch. So you get, we used to get a lot of these. North Pole's moved off a little bit, so we don't get them, they didn't get them quite as often now. But I can remember many nights being out observing at Blackfoot and uh, not being able to see a whole hell of a lot because of Aurora. I've had Aurora so bright out at Blackfoot that she could read a newspaper. <laughs> anyway, that's it, I think. It's just not fair, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, gotta, gotta travel. The, the, the brightest Aurora I ever saw was at the top of McMillan Pass, which is on the uh, Carcross Road, the canal road between Carcross and Norman Wells, right between the Yukon and the North and, and uh, Northwest Territories. I was up there in the middle of winter when it was minus 60 outside and I stuck my head out for a, a few minutes and that's the only time in my life I have ever heard Aurora. Yeah, they got some really nice displays. So thank you for uh, sharing them. Does it, does it cackle, Dave? Like does it- Yeah, it sort of just hisses and crackles, yeah. Yeah, okay. But the question I have, Dave, about that, because I, I've heard a number of reports from folks who, you know, have heard Aurora. Did you sense that the shifting patterns of the light were coincident with changes in the sound? That's important, of course, because sound only travels at a certain speed. Yeah, no, I, I didn't see any connection between what they're doing. I just hear this random hissing and crackling and, uh, and but the lights, you know, the Northern Lights at that time, they were dancing both north and south and, and all around, uh, you couldn't really keep track of any specific pattern. Yeah, And, and it was dark, <laughs> and, except and to, for the and, and to, to Lori's question, I've heard it described as crinkling cellophane sound. Yeah, a little bit like that, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay, so there are no more questions about that. Lori, I think you're up next. Hey, well, I told um, people last week that I had had a phone call from um, Elizabeth Griffin about uh, a compass, an astro compass. And so I did go and pick it and pick it up. And I just wanted to show you um, what it was because somebody said they were interested in it. And it, um, uh, this is a, well, this is, um, this is what it, what it looks like. It's beautifully machined absolutely beautifully machined and so i'm not i don't know anything about this at all i take it for granted that this will sit on something and that this would this would um, move around but i would love to have somebody have a look at this and decide what we need to do with it <laughs> so <laughs> so if um if anybody's interested let me know um uh we you know it could be uh uh, given to somebody who really wants it, or it could be um, put in the um, put in the um, center of the universe for display. I'm not I'm not exactly sure. So, whatever you what people would like to have a look, and um, then the second thing was that um, uh, and to kind of to follow through on the James Webb uh, Space Telescope is the friends of the DAO are going to have two. Um, two programs on uh, uh, the James Webb, um, one on our first star party, which will be on on um, Saturday, November the 20th. So kind of two Saturdays from now. And the next one will be on November, on December the 18th, 
which is actually the supposed launch day, um, and also the summer solstice or the winter solstice, sorry, I oh, wish it was summer, but uh, the winter solstice. And, uh, and so on those days, we have teamed up with um, uh, a, uh, a group that are doing called the James Webb Community Events. And this is through NASA and through the Canadian Space Agency. And Natalie Ouellette is one of the people that is involved in this. And she, they are, they are um, uh, getting different groups across Canada to do speaker series um, for, for it. And I believe that like the one tomorrow where Natalie is going to be talking with, uh, with the other fellow Jean, and I've just lost his name. Sorry. Um, uh, I believe that that's kind of one of the first of the series that is being done. So uh, we're going to be doing we're going to be doing two of those. And on the first night, which is the eight, uh, which is the 20th, we have got um, um, uh, I've just lost the name. Matt Taylor, who comes from the HAA and Chris Willett, who also comes from um, NRC. And they both they both are out of uh, Victoria, and uh, they are both involved. One is going to be talking about the the James Webb, uh, and um, and some of the programs with it, and the and uh, the other Matt Taylor is going to actually be talking a little bit about the program that he's going to be doing. Uh, both of them are what's called um, program leads on the first on the first um, set of science um, programs that are going to be on. There's, a, there's I guess, a program one and a program two, and, uh, and both of them are working on that. And then on the 18th of, of December, there's going to be two more people who are going to be um, giving, uh, giving a presentation, uh, both on kind of what they're doing and how, and how they are, are doing some of the science programming. Um, so we would be really, really happy to have um, everybody come out to these and to uh, help us um, uh, help us uh, with that program and um, and have it so that it's really it's really widely widely disseminated disseminated across I think for a very large um, audience um, for this so um, hopefully we'll have more information for you uh, we'll get out as soon as we have the the um, zoom link we'll um, we'll get it out to everybody so those are the star party star party nights they'll start um, our star party started about seven o'clock and, uh, and then they'll be speaking probably from about seven 20 to about 20 to nine, something like that. They, there's the two and they both have about half an hour with a little bit of time to, um, to, uh, do their question and, and answers. So we're really happy about these. These are, this is really, this is really a, a good, um, a good thing for us to be able to do. So thanks everybody. We hope you're all going to be part of it. <laughs> I guess I should unmute. Any questions for Lori? Okay, I think John, you're next. Okay. Uh, Randy isn't here, but maybe I should just do it anyways. A, a few uh, a few weeks ago. I was showing some uh, some pictures that were uh, the stars were being removed uh, so that you could work on the stars separately. And uh, let me just remind you what that looks like by sharing the screen for a sec. So this, this was the image I started with. And as you can see, there are a lot of stars in it. And this is with the stars taken out. And Randy wondered how that works. What, what is doing that? Because as you can see, it's, it's really, whatever's done it is very effective at getting rid of not just the big stars, the bright ones, but all of them. And it's, it, it's, it's a program called StarNet. And basically it uses something called neural network learning. Um, and I got reminded of this just, let, let me just take the screen off so I can just talk to you. Uh, I got reminded of this when I got a, 
a copy of Physics World, which is the, the news magazine of the, the British Institute of Physics. And <clears throat> there's an article that says machine learning could combat the epidemic spread. And this is being done by some people in Sweden and Italy. And basically they say machine learning could help stop a future epidemic by indicating which individuals should be tested for the disease. And they did a simulation of this. They haven't done it in real life, but they did a simulation. It seemed to work extremely well. Uh, they explored whether it might be possible to eliminate the disease while isolating only a part of the population. And we used a neural network, the same thing that is used to take those stars out of the uh, picture that I showed you. And we use that network to select the individuals that should be tested. And the input consists of contact tracing information for given individuals. And to boost the accuracy, they used neural network, which they basically fed this data and then they tell the neural network when it's got it right. Uh, neural networks learn in much the same way that we learn facial recognition. Our, the neural networks in our brain are very good at putting together a variety of different kinds of information about faces that the people who use the networks don't even know exactly what, what all information they're using but they'll use all kinds of information about where the eyes are, how far apart they are, what the mouth looks like and so on. And they get very good at it by teaching them, by letting them know, letting the program know when it's got it right. So in this case, uh, they found that uh, they needed to isolate in the early, early stages before they even know very much about who's, who's transmitting it. They needed to isolate no more than 25% of the population to reduce the uh, transmission to essentially zero, which I thought was kind of neat. So that, that reminded me of, of what a neat thing it is to have a neural network that takes the stars out of an image and lets you work on the stars separately and then put some of them back in if you wish. Uh, so again, the neural network is trained by showing it what stars look like and having it figure out the characteristics that, that go into making a star. And it's easy to show them what big, you know, fairly bright big stars look like, but it can get very good at recognizing stars, even when they're tiny little blobs that you would have a hard time recognizing even with your eyes. So uh, I'm sorry, Randy isn't here to hear this because he wanted me to do something about the stars. And this article just reminded me that neural networks are kind of neat things. So that's all I have. So, so John, would the, yeah. would the neural network actually name names as to who should be isolated or <laughs> would, it, <laughs> would it pick a spectrum of the population or? <laughs> Well, it, it could. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think, I mean, I don't know everything that these people did, but uh, they're just reporting this as something that might be, yeah. might be useful for the next time we have a, an epidemic. Because what's neat about it is that it, it can work with very little data and still produce very good results. And the problem in the early part of an epidemic is you don't have very much information. So uh, sounds like it could be useful. I do have a I do have a good example of what you're talking about. If you is it okay if I share the screen for just a sure. second? Sure. Let me pull it over. Go for it, Dave. Okay. Get the other stuff out of the way.
it's kind of serendipitous that you were talking about it because I spent a good part of the day um, working on the flying bat and the squid nebula. Mm -hmm. So I, I pulled up, first I pulled up the, the, just the narrow band data that I processed. Um, and on this, you can see the flying bat, which is the hydrogen alpha red spectrum, but you can barely see the, the squid in the, in the middle. You can barely see its outline. But if you want to pull it out, it helps if you first get rid of the stars. So this is with the stars taken away. And it's just that the stars are distracting to your eyes when you're trying to work on a certain part of the image. And now you can see, oops, now you can see the squid that's actually outlined in the middle of the of the flying bat nebula but it is helpful even if you're not going to display it starless it's really helpful in processing to get rid of those stars you did a great job there dave that's that's really neat yeah what what's wonderful about this is that uh the efficiency for getting rid of all of the stars including even the tiny ones is so good it did not get confused by you know, some of the little blobs in the squid that, you know, there have been lots of programs that can take stars out of a, an image in the past, but most of them didn't really work terribly well except for the brighter stars. John, I'm kind of surprised when you remove your stars and, and also in the beautiful shot that Dave showed, they, they don't leave holes. Uh, they, they fill in the nebula uh, that uh, were uh, behind the uh, stars. That puzzles me how they can do that. It, yes, it, it just uses the, uh, the data very close to that region and, and just mimics it by really cloning that data and filling in the gap with that. So that's the way it works. That's exactly what your retina does. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a fudge in, in that sense, but because it does it you know, over such a small area, it's, uh, it's pretty realistic. Very interesting. Thanks for um, sharing that. And uh, we can let Randy know it's there and he can review the uh, recording. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, Chris Gaynor, you're going to update us about the space telescope that's already up there. Yes, uh, just uh, they're continuing to uh, work on this puzzling problem with Hubble, uh, and uh, they actually have uh, uh, one of the instruments working again, but they are not sort of trying to get them all uh, going again. This is kind of a, a signal synchronization problem within the, within the telescope um, that forced it into safe mode. And a few days ago, they, uh, they turned on an instrument called NICMOS, which is actually a, um, uh, a uh, infrared instrument that, that uh, has not been operating for uh, more than a decade, but they thought they, they just turn it on and see, see what was going on. And uh, because uh, if, if they use that and there was a problem, they didn't, have to, they didn't have to worry about it. So they turned it on and it seemed to operate uh, as one would expect. And so they, um, um, uh, I can't remember either earlier today or anyway, quite recently, uh, they, they turned on the advanced camera for surveys, which is uh, what, which of course is one of the cameras on how well, and it's been, it's been working fine. So, uh, so now they're working on, uh, uh, on getting the, 
other instruments up and running again. And they're, they're looking at, uh, at kind of the software situation. Um, it could be possibly the, the way uh, some signals are rooted inside the telescope. And, um, uh, and they may have to change that to prevent um, the problem they had a couple of weeks ago. So, so Hubble is kind of operating uh, in part now with with uh, one of the important instruments going, and uh, and hopefully uh, when they switch on the other ones, it will continue to work. But we'll uh, we'll see how that all works out. Um, well, I've uh, got the floor. Um, the um, uh, there was another kind of. Uh, milepost for the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, they just announced the other day that the uh, uh, shroud on top of the rocket uh, that will enclose uh, JWST until it's above the atmosphere has been cleared for flight. They had a couple of problems with the shroud. You know, these things come off, uh, are supposed to protect uh, the, the spacecraft uh, during the launch phase and then come off when it gets out of the atmosphere. And it's over the years, it's been amazing how many times uh, shroud problems have screwed things up, you know, uh, uh, including uh, I think one of the very early Mariner probes failed because the, sh the shroud failed and things like that. And uh, they had a couple of problems uh, with those shrouds on, on a couple of Ariane launches a year or two ago. So they wanted to get two good launches in and they got the second one in uh, uh, with uh, nominal shroud operation. So that's, that's good. So uh, things are proceeding and they're, uh, they're, they're, they're starting into uh, getting uh, JWST on the rocket for its uh, launch on December 18th. Um, that, by the way, I think Chris, may, uh, somebody last week uh, uh, thought it was early in the morning, and they are right. Uh, not so early for Peter, uh, but uh, I think it's about 4.30 in the morning for those of us uh, in the Pacific time zone. Uh, so uh, so we're going to have to get up and watch it and then make sure we get some shut-eye before the, uh, the DAO event that evening, I guess. Um, and actually, uh, somebody, uh, something else uh, I should uh, mention has happened in the past week. Um, the decision making uh, that goes on in the US astronomical community about uh, uh, astronomy and especially, especially space telescopes uh, is, uh, uh, sorted out in, in decadal surveys, once a, de uh, once a decade. Um, and there's a big process in the astronomical community. People uh, make submissions to a, a committee that's specially struck by the National Academy of Sciences. And, uh, and then there's input from all around the, the committee to try and determine what are the priorities of astronomers. And, uh, and, and so we had a once in a decade event when the decadal survey for the 2020s came out, I believe it was on Friday, it was four days ago, um, Thursday or Friday, the uh, report for the 2020s uh, came out. And it's quite, uh, it's quite a, a, an interesting report. It covers all sorts of things, you know, including uh, um, matters such as diversity in astronomy and things like that. Um, but uh, of course, uh, a lot of the attention is focused on, well, what's the big thing they're going to recommend? And, and they're talking about, uh, in, in this report, building uh, a, a, a large uh, infrared optical ultraviolet space telescope with high contrast imaging and spectroscopy as the first mission uh, to enter. And it will be part of a uh, the telescope uh, will be roughly six meters in diameter or the aperture. Um, and it would be a, uh, a part of a new generation of the great observatories. Of course, the 
Hubble, uh, uh, along with Compton and Chandra and Spitzer, uh, were the first uh, generation um, uh, great observatories. But anyway, um, if you if you want to see uh, what's going on in the future, uh, you should uh, uh, check out that uh, the uh, just the twenty twenty. Uh, dec uh, dec uh, decadal survey for the 2020s. Um, uh, that telescope that they're talking about now, uh, e even if things uh, go according to schedule, um, it won't be launched until uh, the 2040s. So I'm not sure all of us are going to be around to see it. But anyway, uh, astronomy marches on. And uh, and then uh, one more thing, just as our meeting was coming together, a Dragon spacecraft with four astronauts uh, splashed down. And I think they're just pulling them out of the spacecraft right now. So uh, um, that's a space station mission. And there's a, another crew going up to the space station later in the week. So that's what I have to say. Thanks for the updates, Chris. Chris, how does that US um, survey affect what Canadian Space Agency wants to do, and what what like the like NRC or the the or CASCA would also put forward. Well, uh, 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 the Canadian uh, uh, astronomical community has kind of a similar process uh, that they that they they do on their own and. Uh, but obviously, there's there's a certain amount of coordination. You know, the James, you know, James Webb uh, was was part of a process like that, and we signed on to it. Um, and uh, uh, while it's widely believed that 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 Hubble, uh, the, the the story of Hubble in the, the very early decadal survey of the time is a bit of a twisted tale, and I won't I won't tell it to you now. But obviously. Uh, obviously, there's a lot. There's a lot of astronomers uh, on this side of the line uh, who are uh, 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 reading that with great interest because uh, you know uh, we might potentially take part. But even if we don't have a formal part in it, you know, uh, a lot of uh, Canadian astronomers will probably be using that telescope. You know, uh, you know, as they do with Hubble, even though we aren't formally a part of the, the Hubble program. But we are with James Webb, of course. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Um, that was everybody I had on the speakers list, other than I was going to say, uh, David Lee, could you um, remind us about our speaker next week? Yeah, I'm, I was really pleased that uh, uh, Emily Levesque, who just wrote uh, The Last Stargazers uh, book, uh, has. Uh, agreed to speak to us next week. So I, I really enjoyed her, um, uh, her book. Uh, it talks about a lot of um, places around the world that she's been like observatories. And I especially like the description of Kitt Peak having been there a few years ago. Uh, it was very, very descriptive. And I think she mentions uh, um, a number of astronomers that we may well know <laughs> and I'll let you read the book to, to see who those people might be. Uh, but uh, yeah, I am really looking forward to her uh, her talk coming up next week. And uh, if you know of people who might like to attend, um, you can feel free to uh, share the link because we're not. Uh, I mean, it will just go to our center members. But uh, but if you do uh, think of people who might be interested, please let them know. Nice to have some more people attend the uh, the talks. Is it okay if I post it on the London Center forums? I, sure. I don't really, I don't really see why not. Um, uh, I think the uh, the time will be a bit of a detriment for people in the east anyway. So you have to really want to see it, uh, but that's fine. No, I think that would be good. And and assuming we get permission to record, then it would be available if people didn't want to see her talk anyway. So exactly, yeah. Uh, does anybody else have anything for this evening? Otherwise, I think we're uh, we're at the end. Uh, Chris, I got a piece of birthday cake there for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <It's> yummy. <laughs> Where, where's my piece, uh, Reg? 
Yeah. You got to send it out to everybody there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> don't have sorry, a I ate your piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's virtual, so enjoy it. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> virtual cake. Good, 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 good uh, weight loss technique. <laughs> Anybody else have anything? Well, if not, we'll be back next week for um, a guest speaker. Um, we'll see. You know, we'll certainly do that first, and then if there's time for anything at the end, uh, we can we can cover those. Otherwise, um, you know, can defer those a week. So, um, yeah, thanks again to uh, everybody who's presented tonight, and hope everybody has a great, great kind of soggy, windy week. It looks like it's going to be. Um, but uh, hopefully no more of those uh, water spout tornado things. <laughs> yeah, batten down the hatches overnight. We're, we're supposed to get a good blow. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Anyways, take care, everyone, and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week.